You've got a 58 year old male who he found at home. Uh, he's basically got 12 hours of increasing shortness of breath and then about an hour worth of really sharp, like pleuritic chest pain. Um, the shortness of breath worsens significantly with exertion. The chest pain gets uh, far worse with deep inspiration, which is what, what pleuritic chest pain means. Um, and he's also had some weird left leg swelling over the last day or so for the last like 24 hours. Uh, he recently was on a flight from Europe to the U.S., for vital signs, his heart rate is 118, his blood pressure is 86 over 58, breath rate of 28, and then an SpO2 of 94. We'll say everything else is fine. So, we know he's in a form of obstructive shock. Form what what cause of a what subcategory of electric or of uh, obstructive shock do we think is going on here? Yeah, right. He's having a PE. Specifically, he's having a massive PE, right? So he's having a massive PE. Massive PE, so we have um, low-risk PE, submassive PE, and massive PE. Um, low, uh, PE in general, right, means you have a clot somewhere in the pulmonary vascular system, right? A low-risk PE means you don't have a hemodynamic consequence to that PE, to that clot load. Uh, intermediate risk or uh, submassive, those are the same things. They're kind of used interchangeably depending on what book you read. Um, you have signs and symptoms of right heart failure, but no hemodynamic consequence yet. So you have like right ventricular dilation, for example, on an ultrasound or something like that. Basically, that obstruction is actually causing a backflow, just not enough to like drop their blood pressure and stuff like that yet. And you have a massive PE which, or a high risk PE, again, same kind of a thing, um, where you have signs and symptoms of right heart failure with hemodynamic compromise massive pe and submassive pe people get this confused a lot doesn't mean the size of the clot it's the consequence of the clot is how it's named so specifically when we talk about obstructive shock we're talking about massive pe so it's a pe causing hemodynamic change um looking at this guy's so he's shortness of breath right and that's a that's a big one for pe um, specifically shortness of breath with the normal sounding lungs, right? And then you have, in that's, I'm talking like traditional signs and symptoms, right? Because you can also have, if you have a smaller PE that goes into a lower part of the lung, you can infarct that area and you can actually get um, kind of rails in that area. You can get some bronchi. You can get adventitious lung sounds with PE, but the traditional teaching is you have like severe shortness of breath with clear lungs kind of a deal. And that's going to be a trend moving forward. Then you have that pleuritic chest pain. Pleuritic chest pain is basically chest pain that worsens significantly significantly on inspiration, um, which is a big hallmark of PE traditionally. Um, an interesting weird fact, uh, have you ever just randomly been sitting there and kind of just got some chest pain for a second? Like you took a deep breath and you're like, wow, that sucked. And then it just went away. Yeah, so turns out, those are miniature PEs that are essentially getting stuck in your lung real quick and then getting taken away because your body is really good at getting rid of clots. And everyone, that's that's for everyone, right? Everyone has those moments. That's not like, you know, you're dying, they're going to die of a PE. Don't think that. Um, but it's just one of those things like, yeah, those are little PEs that you just cleared a PE out, which is kind of a terrifying <laughs> thing. So you can diagnose that failure based on signs and symptoms, based on hypotension, based on a couple different things. Um, those with ultrasound, technically, to diagnose submassive PE versus non-clinical PE or like a low-risk PE, um, you specifically look for um, one of two big things in ultrasound. You have you look at the right side of the heart, and basically, if that's dilated um, or back pressuring, you can consider it a submassive PE at that point. Or um, you look at their IVC, so their um, their vena cava, and you you'll take a look at that and um, basically how that reacts to fluid and how that reacts during inspiration stuff. You can do it based on that. That's kind of out of the scope of this talk, but there's ways to look with an ultrasound, like in the field, um, if your agency carries that. Some do, like my 911 agency does. So it can be in really big, massive PE. That's a super rare finding. And it's almost always found in post-mortem. Um, 
but it's almost always someone who died of massive PE. Um, it's not generally something we're going to see, but that line of demarcation thing is a thing that can happen with PE. Um, it would be a super, not necessarily even late finding, it's just it's a finding um, for very, very, very significant PE. And a couple other things can cause it too. Um, the last time I actually saw it, or I should say really the only time I've really saw it wasn't even on a PE. Um, we had a patient who had a tumor that basically sat in their mediastinum and it ruptured. Uh, and they had that like demarcation line and it's the same kind of pathology behind the two um you're just you're blocking venous return from that point forward or blood flow from that point forward um but so that's something you can look for as well but usually a post-mortem sign it's like the whole like tracheal deviation when it comes to tension pneumo and we'll talk about that later um it's almost always a post-mortem finding it's it's a super late finding we have increasing shortness of breath portic chest pain we have kind of all the traditional signs of symptoms of a pe and they have that leg swelling so the vast majority of pe's um and i mean like greater than 90 percent of pe's come from a dbt or a basically a clot that's in the lower extremities generally uh can be in the pelvis as well um that kind of forms and then breaks off and it can form for things like you know patients who are sitting still for a long time right uh surgical patients who just had big surgeries especially orthopedic surgeries being on birth control is a big risk for females because it causes clotting problems unilateral leg swelling is a big sign so then we take a look at the vitals um we definitely have a big shock index there right heart rate's 118 versus a systolic blood pressure of 86 that's definitely a you know pulse pressure or a uh, shock index greater than one um that blood pressure is Super concerning, especially for a PE patient. They're tachypnic because they're not getting air. At least the body thinks it's not. And they're starting to get a little um, hypoxic. So let's talk about kind of PE specifically. So again, usually it starts kind of as a formation of a thrombus and a deep vein, usually of the lower legs. Uh, then you get embolization of that thrombus, right? A thrombus is a blood clot. An embolization is a mobile blood clot. And then that leads to eventually obstruction in the pulmonary vasculature. <clears throat> Again, we have that three classification things. You have low risk, intermediate risk, or submassive, and then high risk or massive. Um, PE is really the pathophysiology comes down to two major consequences. One, you have something called VQ mismatch issues. So you have ventilation perfusion mismatch. Because if you think about it, right, um, if you picture your alveoli, you have air coming into the alveoli, and then you have a capillary kind of running underneath it, right? It's like the universal sign of alveoli. Um in PE, you have that alveoli working fine. Air is coming in. Oxygen's coming in. You just don't have blood flow. So you get a mismatch of perfusion and ventilation. Uh, and that can cause hypoxemia and shortness of breath. But interestingly, that's not what kills the patient, right? Everyone thinks it's a respiratory problem or a hypoxia problem, and it's not. Your body's actually pretty good at compensating for that. What happens and why people die of PE is, is hemodynamic collapse, Right. Because if a significant portion of that pulmonary artery gets blocked, and that's different for every person, right? Um, whatever your significant portion is, um, you basically get a marked increase of pulmonary vascular resistance. So you have a really high right heart afterload. And that's the big problem there. Your right heart, unlike your left heart, right? Your, your left heart's used to pumping against your blood pressure, especially patients with like hypertension, right? Your left heart's really strong. If you look at the picture of the heart, right? Even looking at most pictures, that left ventricle is way stronger because it's pushing against all this really hard pressure all the time. Your right ventricle isn't. Your right ventricle is pretty weak because it doesn't have to be strong. It's just pumping through some lungs and then back into the heart. It's pretty easy to do that. So basically anything that's going to raise that pressure that it, that right ventricle has to face is going to make it you know, ischemic and not like it. Everyone thinks that the the clot is the big problem in PE, and it, and it is a problem, but it's not necessarily the biggest problem. Um, you can knock off an entire portion of your pulmonary vasculature and be fine, hemodynamically anyway. The jam is that you get these that clot, that formation of that clot in the pulmonary vasculature releases a whole bunch of vasoactive agents, um, basically your inflammatory response to that area, which then clamps the vessels down. So now you have more right heart afterload and more pulmonary vascular resistance. So all that blood starts really backloading into that right ventricle and you go into right heart failure. 
So the healthy, uh, normal healthy kind of right ventricle can withstand up to 50% obstruction of the vasculature. So you can basically knock off an entire lung and still be fine, not have any signs or symptoms yet. But that's, you know, the healthy patient. Most of our patients with PEs are not the healthy patient, right? They have a whole bunch of comorbidities. They have COPD, they have asthma, they have hypertension, they have heart disease, they have, you know, um, peripheral vascular disease, those types of things. Um, they're smokers, they are liver failure patients. They're, you know, it's a bunch of patients who generally have a bunch of comorbidities anyway. And in those patients, that 50% is a lot lower. But basically what happens is all of that blockage in the lung creates that back pressure in the right ventricle and you get right ventricular overload, which causes right ventricular dilation. So that ventricle is going to dilate and get bigger and get weaker when it does that. And you're going to have something called increased wall tension. So that fluid's going to back up and back up and back up and push against that ventricular wall. The right ventricle can't handle that pressure. So it's going to quit. It's not going to be able to pump that out. And at the same time, as your right ventricle is not able to pump that blood out, it's going to start to bow into that left ventricle and make it so your left ventricle is going to suck too. And the jam with that, right, is if your right ventricle can't pump, take the blood from the body and pump it into the lungs to then go into the left heart to go into the body, if you're, you are got the traffic jam in that right heart, it ends up being no blood getting into the left heart either, which drops your blood pressure, drops your cardiac output, and you go into shock. The heart can only pump out what it's put in. And if the right ventricle fails to provide blood to the left ventricle, the left ventricle can't provide blood to the body. And that's the big jam with PE. ECMO is a big, uh, it's a common intervention for these really sick patients. Ultimately, what they need is either TPA or heparin. Um, get rid of the clot that way. But, um, you know, we definitely put a fair number of patients on ECMO for massive PE. Treatment for EMS uh, is going to be mostly supportive care. And when I say supportive care, everyone's like, oh, supportive care, boring, like O2, oxygen, pulmonary, and et cetera, et cetera. Turns out supportive care and shock is the vast majority of shock treatment. Good supportive care is what will save your patient. Um, and really here, your supportive care is focused on that right ventricle. You need to support that right ventricle. Um, things like positive pressure ventilation will drop right ventricular problems. Um, things like intubation right? CPAP, BiPAP, intubation, putting it in, they, these types of patients on positive pressure at all will make it worse. You really want to try to avoid doing that if you think it's a massive PE or something like that. Um, you know, these patients die when they're intubated. Um, but like things like positive pressure, intubation, right? You're going to decrease that right, um, you're going to decrease that right side pressures, right? And that's going to lead to a reduced or you're going to, I'm sorry, increase those uh, right-sided heart pressures, which is going to reduce your venous return into the heart, which is going to reduce your cardiac output even more. It does that to a normal patient when they're intubated for an elective anesthesia case. Never mind someone whose right heart is already failing. The other big thing with these patients is you have to be super careful with fluid, right? So when we think about, let's say, right heart failure from a massive right-sided MI, right? Well, what's the first thing they tell you? Oh, don't give nitro, give fluid, right? And that makes sense for that ischemic, you know, MI ventricle, because that ventricle turns out will contract harder by giving it more fluid. It'll stretch more, and by stretching more, it'll snap more, and by snapping more, it'll put more blood in. The GM here is as a roadblock ahead of it, right? So, you're going to put a whole bunch more fluid into a ventricle that's already way overloaded. And you're just going to make that overloading worse. Some patients will be okay with some fluid. And the general recommendation is to do like, you know, 250 to 500 mLs at a time. If they get worse, stop. If they don't, give up to a liter and kind of stop. And that's like with long transports. That's not something you're going to do in a five-minute transport, right? So you have to be careful with positive pressure and you have to be really careful with fluid. Those are the two big key supportive care things with this. And then obviously early vasopressors, if you're able to do those. I don't know what your scope is and or your protocols and stuff in your different regions of Canada. The reason the CPAP and intubation is wrong, um, and it's not necessarily wrong. Like they, they, some of these patients do have to be intubated and it just sucks because you like you know it's going to make them worse for a bit because um, you ultimately do have to oxygenate. The jam is that, you know, intubation, putting someone on... So, Blood flow back to the heart, right? We think of 
the heart as a pump and we think of it kind of as a traditional pump and that like um almost like a pool pump right where it pulls water in spins it around and shoots it back out some other end our heart doesn't actually work that way right our hearts what's called a passively filling pump so our heart is completely dependent on the flow coming into it so you could picture like the heart sitting at the bottom of a waterfall and the water coming down into it. It's completely dependent on that river above it. It has nothing to do with the heart sucking blood, right? Flow requires pressures. So it has to go from a high pressure to a low pressure. It's also how wind works. There's a weird random science side note. Um, but you're going from a high pressure to a low pressure. So you're going from a low pressure venous system to a really low pressure right heart system. That right heart has to be really low, if not negative pressure, for blood flow to come back to the heart. When you put someone on positive pressure, so when you intubate them, for example, you're changing that negative pressure physiology that they do and keeps that pressure nice and low to a increased pressure physiology because you're shoving pressure into that right heart, essentially. So you're actually limiting flow more just by intubating someone. And that's just anyone, never mind a PE patient. Most people will get through that, right? Like if I, you know, was coming in for my surgery, I will get through that just fine. It's not going to destroy my hemodynamics. I'm a relatively healthy person. When you have someone with already failing right heart, with their heart pressures already elevated, you're going to elevate them a lot more by intubating them. Uh, we carry epi. Yeah, right. So epi uh, is a good choice. And actually, epi, there's a fair argument to be made that epi is actually even better than norepi in P massive PE. Um, there's a lot of like stuff looking at that. And it probably doesn't matter. We're probably nitpicking a little bit, but either epi or norepi would work fine. Um, I don't actually have a strong opinion on either for these patients. Sometimes that uh, heart squeeze that comes with the epi is a little helpful. So vasopressors aren't going to help the clotting issue. Vasopressors are going to help that heart squeezing because you have a right heart failure. That, that ventricle is not squeezing blood out anymore, which is what's causing the shock. I mean, what's causing the shock is the massive clot that's sitting in their lungs. Um, but in order to support that until some other stuff can work, we need to give pressors, specifically inotropes, right, to give that heart more squeeze. So that's the goal with the vasopressors. To maintain hemodynamics, exactly. Um, so that's kind of where EMS lives, right, is in that area. In the ER, what they're going to do is they're going to put the patient on anticoagulation. So they're going to be on some form of like a heparin or a Lovenox or something like that. Um, and what that does, that heparin is not going to get rid of that clot. It's going to prevent the clot from getting worse. And that's going to be the goal there with that. The actual goal for massive PE is thrombolytics. Right. So they're going to get like TPA, TNK, just like they would for a stroke or a STEMI. It's just a slightly different dose. And it's a faster dose just because it's a different thing. Um, but if patients can't get that for whatever reason, they can do, um, you know, you can go to like interventional radiology and they can do mechanical thrombectomy and stuff like that too, which is super cool.